Welcome to Koyaike, Chile, where Meredith and I will be calling home for the next five weeks. Nestled in the heart of Patagonia, it's been a dream of ours to explore this beautiful country. If you missed our recent video, we have finally settled in after our first week. We are already falling in love with this town, even if we can't pronounce it. If you have interest in following the journey over the next five weeks, be sure to like and subscribe to this video. Just finished our first week in Kaihoke. And on our run this morning, we were talking about the first week and reflecting on kind of what took place this week. And I think if you watch all the videos that we put together this week, it probably would come off as a pretty relaxed week. You'd probably say you spent a week in Chile and did what? But boy, did we have a great week! Yeah, and I think it was like the perfect intro to Chile because I think we needed a week to just establish ourselves here, get some healthy routines with running again, understand the grocery stores. We made two awesome friends this week. Now we have friends in town. We can navigate the town without any maps to get to the grocery stores, the coffee shops, home, the new mm -hmm. home. Yep. So we no longer are half a line in town. No, we established a running route that was awesome. We found a great coffee shop, actually multiple, but we found kind of like the home one and tons of trails that we've now discovered as of yesterday. Yeah, so we are, we're gearing up, we're knowing the town. And what's great is if we came here for just a week, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have done anything we've done this week. No, but because we're here for five weeks, I felt like it was okay to just come here and observe and relax into it and get into a good rhythm of our own before we start adding in all this fun adventures and making all these new friends. Like it was nice to have five days of us just observing the town. Um, and it was really cool because all these observations that we made throughout the week were then verified by friends that we made along the way when we'd ask questions like, hey, we noticed that there's a ton of dogs everywhere. What's the story? And um, our friend Patrick explained it to us. Yeah, which brings us to the next segment. Our observations of Chile, or at least this town, after the first week of observing. Maps are so confusing. I thought we were so far south and so close to the end of the world. Check out this map of Chile and how close to Antarctica it is. It like looks said, like we're there. It's alarmingly close. Yeah. We get these Antarctic winds and these dark clouds and storms. We're below where like South uh, Africa is on the line. Like I just feel like we're at the end of the world. Or so we thought we were very far south. Yeah. Until we recently found out we're only at the 45th parallel, which means halfway between the equator and the South Pole. Which means it's just like we're in Portland, Oregon. Or northern Michigan. So we're not even as south as you'd be if you were living, or north as you would be if you're living in Norway or Alaska or any of those places. We're or just, southern Canada. We're in Maine. We're in Maine. And I thought we were so much further south because the maps look confusing. So, uh, joke's on us, we're far south, but we're not that far south. Yep. Observation number two. Meredith, tell them about the dogs. Okay, so obviously you've seen tons of dogs in our cl clips from this week. They're everywhere. And we mentioned they actually look pretty well groomed. That's because a lot of them are pets, and I guess it's a part of the culture to allow your dog to roam free. Like, the idea is your dog should be able to go wherever it wants during the day, and then it comes back home at night. Um, and they're a lot more relaxed about that. And the dogs here, I would say, are so friendly. They're Strong. all in great shape. They're all really happy. I've never felt threatened by a dog walking around town. And nope. I'm a very nervous person around dogs that are off leash or dogs that I don't know. She's going to get over her fear very yeah, quickly. I think so. It's not that I don't like dogs. It's just that it's intimidating when you're somewhere and you're out on a run and it's just you and a straight, you know, stranger and dog that you don't know. Um, and just this week, I felt so relaxed with the dogs here. Almost every run we go on, we end up getting joined by at least one dog for a yeah. little bit. And there's a dog outside our oh, window right now. that was one that came by the other day. Yeah, yeah, he was the one who was guarding our house, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Good dogs here. Observation number three. It's about the Spanish here. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because we're just foreigners, but everyone seems so soft-spoken. But even when we're eavesdropping on other people's conversations in Spanish, they just talk really soft. Mm -hmm. It's a very soft, not an abrasive and aggressive yeah. speaking tone. And people are so willing to slow down for oh you. Oh my gosh, they're so nice when they talk with us. They're so patient with us. They'll, you know, they're, we'll say, hola, como estas? And they'll speak normal, soft, but fast. Mm -hmm. And we'll say, ah, ooh. And they'll go, oh. And then they'll repeat it slower, yeah. word for word. We'll get half of it. Mm -hmm. And we'll ask for clarification sometimes, and they'll switch up the sentences. They seem more willing than anywhere else we've been so far yeah. to want to communicate with us and help us learn the language 
or at least communicate back. And I think they get really excited when we try. Like even if we're off just a little bit, they understand the gist of what we're trying to say. They smile. They'll actually even correct us and teach us the right yep. words. Um, I can tell our Spanish has gotten better this week. And I was super intimidated to come to South America because I heard the Spanish is so fast. And I had a hard time with it in Spain. So I was like, oh my gosh, there's no way I'm going to be able to do it down here. But I think it's going to be better for us because we'll learn with a faster version of Spanish. So when we go to countries like Spain where the Spanish is a little bit slower, maybe we'll be better at it. Yeah. I don't know. That's just a guess. It's what's going on. They also slow down when they talk to us, so I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. We're getting there though, and we'll the see. point is they're very happy to help us learn, and they'll just overjoyed that we're trying. Yeah. Um, Which is really cool. Yeah. Although I did have a faux pas today at the coffee shop. Oh my gosh, you did. That's our element, let me tell you. The coffee shop is our element, and we haven't used English in a coffee shop, I don't know, since week one in Spain. No problemo. So I ordered everything today, and I said, we're having it for takeaway. And she said, okay, que es tu nombre? I mistakenly thought that meant number, not name. I don't know why, it's Spanish 101. It was just in the moment, I'm like, oh, what's your number? Ah, because it's takeaway, she's gonna call us when it's ready. So I said, ah, no tengo un nombre. Which means I don't have a name. I was thinking I don't have a telephone number. She looks at me like I'm a crazy person and says, your name, what's your name? I'm like, ah. Oops. So then I said Colin. And then she looked confused and was like, oh, you, it's Grievous, you write it. <laughs> so I write it down and then I forgot that my name's Colin with two L's and in, two, uh, in Spanish, two L's has a different sound. So then when they called us to tell us the coffee was ready, it was Cayenne, Cayenne. And now I call him Cayenne. Just like the pepper. <laughs> All, right. All right, observation number four. Kind of patient people. Always washing their cars. People always wash their cars. Obviously, this is from one week in one town, so this is probably not a thing consistent throughout the country whatsoever. However, the one neighborhood that we are living in, on the village, there are car wa people washing their cars everywhere you go. At least two times a day we see somebody washing their car. Yeah, that's if we exclude the guy across the street from us who's washing it every single day. He's always washing his car. So in addition to him, probably twice a day we see people washing the cars, which is great. All the cars are clean. Yeah. It's just unique. Yeah, I just haven't seen so many people washing their cars, but I don't, maybe there's not a car washing time. I don't know. We don't have a car. No, we don't. <laughs> All right. So one of, actually I would say two of my favorite like snacking foods are cherries and carrots. When we're back home in the States, we buy those pre-cut carrots all the time. Like I eat those almost every day. Every single day. And we rarely buy cherries because they're just so expensive. So unless like, it's, you know, a special occasion, we don't really buy them. Here, the prices are reversed. So cherries sold on the side of the street by really sweet ladies like this one are like $3 for a kilo? Yeah. Is it a kilo? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, $3 for a kilo. And then carrots, we got two bags of them at the grocery store and it cost us five dollars a bag it was the most expensive food that we purchased was yep. carrots the final observation after our first week is that people are so willing to give you their number <laughs> at first i thought they're just hitting on meredith but then they're like no not to her do you have a phone number? <laughs> i don't have a number here and that's like okay we'll get her number instead people we meet at the coffee shops our waiter at the coffee shop everyone just like as soon as we meet a person and we like establish a little bit of a friendship, like where are you guys from? We explain that we're from the United States, that we're here for five weeks. Immediately the next thing is, can I have your phone number? Let's make plans. Yeah. It's so me. nice. I will be here to help you if you have questions. Yes. Yeah, we have three phone numbers now if you want time, um, which is awesome. Yeah. And it, it just in a kind way, never creepy. No, it's just always like, oh, hey, you're living in town. Like you probably need a phone number of somebody. Let me give you my so, one. Yeah. Great people in Chile. Very kind. Yeah. So while we're in Chile, well, really for traveling Europe, our goal was to stay under $100 a day. We mm -hmm. figured Europe's more expensive than a lot of other places in the world, so we upped our budget a little bit for it, and we were, we were pretty much right on target yeah. um, when you average everything out, which up top. Proud of us. So our goal for Chile was at most $100 a day, but we really wanted to stay under $75 a day. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of an arbitrary number, but can't burn through all of our money if we want to do this for a while. Uh, after our housing in Chile, which we booked for longer term, so we got a bit of a discount, mm -hmm. our daily allowance comes out to $38 a day. 
Yep. Now this is to cover uh, transportation, activities, food, coffee. Everything. Yeah. Um, after week one, we are five U.S. dollars over that thirty-eight dollars a day budget, mm -hmm. which isn't too bad. That's a dollar a day. Yeah. Um, and that five dollars definitely came from those carrots. <laughs> <laughs> if we didn't buy the two bags of carrots, we'd be five dollars under budget. <gasps> Dang it! However, we know better uh, for this upcoming week. Yep. Yeah, but I think we can. Seventy-five dollars a day seems pretty doable, and we're gonna try to have some no spend days. So then that's like an immediate thirty-eight dollars that we can apply towards a car rental or towards an activity. And if we have one or two of those each week, then after two weeks we'll be able to go do a, a bigger activity. Yeah. So. Yeah. We're not the best budget travelers, but we're going to try. <laughs> we're, well, we're also not in a, the most budget friendly place. Yes. And that leads to one other thing that we've been thinking about. Traveling is such a skill. And I think we all like, you see the pictures on Instagram, you see the people on YouTube and you're like, oh wow, traveling looks so fun and easy. Glamorized. Yeah, it is so glamorized, but it's hard too. And it's a different kind of hard everywhere you go. But we were talking about it this week and I think when you put yourself in those situations, whether it's traveling really quickly through Europe and trying to catch trains and buses and figure out new networks within different cities, or you're coming to a country where not a lot of people speak English and so you're trying to just get around in town, I think there's a skill that comes with it and each time that you go and do that, you grow within your comfort zone a little bit more to what you're able to do, like maybe the next time that you come here, you go to a country where you're like, you don't even have a baseline for the language, like we came to, you know, uh, Chile with a baseline of Spanish, but when when we go to Kazakhstan, we're not going to have any kind of baseline of the language. And so I think every time that you travel, you're able to push yourself a little bit further to get outside of your comfort zone to experience more of the world. Um, and that's a big takeaway this week. Big takeaway. And there's a, a large difference between uh, traveling quickly, mm -hmm. in which you don't need to necessarily run into the walls that you do when you're traveling slowly, and there's a difference between traveling and vacationing. Vacations yeah. are easy. We are top-notch vacationers. <laughs> we are so good at vacationing. The other difference is international versus domestic travel. Yeah. Meredith and I have been slow traveling the U.S. for almost three years before we decided to go international, and we had it down to a system. We could plan entire months yeah. after 30 minutes of planning, and it would be unforgettable, magical. And I think I just assumed that when we travel the world, we'll just copy-paste this, like, amazing... I know, like routine that we had found, like booking Airbnbs, finding the right towns. Like we just had a system down of how we were figuring out where to go. And once we get there, we can establish ourselves really well. And within two weeks, we could make anywhere in the United States feel like home. And we did. Going international, though, that gets a little bit more tricky. Yeah. And it's a new skill to tap into, is traveling slowly international. Yeah. But we're learning. We're growing. And we're, we're flexing our travel muscles. Yeah. We're definitely not the best travelers yet, but uh, we're getting there. Yeah. Thanks so much for watching our video about our thoughts after our first week in Chile. We've learned a lot, but there's so much more to learn. Join us next week as we embark on a road trip with our new neighbor, Patrick.